Well, welcome everyone. My name is Julia Myers, and I am the Community Coordinator for Terga Madison in Wisconsin-Madison. I'm so excited to welcome over 400 people from 33 countries and five continents to this talk. This webinar will include a roughly one hour presentation by Dr. Davidson, followed by a Q&A session. Before we start, I would like to go over a few practical items. Um, oops. Let's review some of the features of our Zoom webinar. This slide is important for those who are taking advantages of our interpreters who will translate this talk into four different languages, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, and German. In this slide, you can see two menus, a computer view and a mobile device view. Hopefully, you have found the interpretation feature for your language if you are using translation. It is located in the menu bar at the bottom right of your screen, where you will find a list of languages available for translation. It looks like a little globe in the computer view. In the mobile view, it can be found where you see the three dots on the right. Pick your language, and then you can choose, you can mute your presenter and listen only to the interpreter. Let's take a couple of polls here. Um, Celine, are you there to do the polls? Okay, first poll is if you can all hear us. Celine, can you also do a speaker few, please? Okay, it seems that almost everybody can hear us. Um, we have a tech team in the background, and they will help the people who can't hear. The next poll is which languages you are using. Thank you, excellent. And I think this is done, good. Celine, can you please do a speaker view, if you may? So the next slide shows the interactive features of this Zoom webinar. Um, the chat is on the left-hand side. The chat box is right now open to say hello and to tell us where you're from. We will, we will close this once the talk begins and we open it at the end of the webinar. The other features in this Zoom webinar are the raise hand feature, if you are asked to raise your hand, the polls that you have seen right now, um, Dr. Davidson will also do uh, one or two polls, and the Q&A, this is where you can ask technical questions or submit questions to Dr. Davidson for the Q&R section immediately following the presentation. Whoops. And it is now my honor to introduce Dr. Richard Davidson. Dr. Davidson is the founder and director of the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is also the William James and Vilas Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he has been a faculty member since 1984. Davidson is best known for his groundbreaking work studying emotion and the brain. A friend and confidant of the Dalai Lama, he is a highly thought-after expert and speaker. 
leading conversations on well-being on international stages such as the World Economic Forum, where he serves on the Global Council of Mental Health. Time magazine named Davidson one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2006. How does meditation contribute to our well-being? In this talk, Dr. Davidson, who has spent decades researching connections between mental and physical health and working with experienced meditators like Minga Rinpoche and Mathieu Ricard to study the effects of meditation on the brain, will share the latest findings and insights into what science tells us about how the practice of training our minds can shape our brains in ways that promote human flourishing. And with this, it is truly my honor to welcome Dr. Richard Davidson. Thank you so much, Yulia. Uh, and for those of you who uh, are not from Madison, Yulia is our local community coordinator for our Madison Turgar group, and uh, she does her work uh, so uh, remarkably well and uh, has been holding our community together during this very challenging time in such uh, gracious and beautiful ways. And we are so incredibly appreciative that we have Yulia uh, uh, as our community coordinator. So thank you, Yulia. One of the uh, strange blessings of this challenging time in which we live is normally I have been giving science of meditation talks to the local Madison Turgar community once or twice a year for quite a long time. Uh, and uh, because of COVID, we are offering this to the global community. And so it's so heartening to see uh, so many people from so many different places around the world, uh, including my dear, dear friends from uh, Turgar, Moscow. Uh, so thank you for joining uh, folks from different parts of Europe, from Mexico, uh, from Chile, other parts of uh, uh, South America. It's really wonderful to have all of you with us today. Before we get going, uh, I'd like to just do uh, an initial poll and uh, ask about your experience with meditation. So uh, I know that there's probably a varied range of experience of folks who are joining us today. Uh, and Scott, I wonder if you can put up this first poll about experience with meditation. I believe Celine has that poll, Christine. Okay. Well, thank you, Scott. So, Celine, uh, great. Thank you. How long have you been meditating? One year or less, five years or more, 10 years or more than 10 years? This is great. We have uh, quite a range. Uh, we have quite a few long-term meditators who've been meditating 10 years or more, uh, but we also have plenty of folks who are really at the early stages of their journey. So uh, welcome, everyone. And this is meant to be uh, an offering for everyone, um, uh, whatever your experience might be, whether you have been meditating a long time or really have never meditated before. So thank you for sharing. And uh, I'd like to begin with just a very short period of practice to bring us all together to this moment. So you can close your eyes if that feels comfortable since we sit so much in front of screens these days. But if you're more comfortable with eyes open, that's fine too. And let's sit in an upright posture, not too tight, not too loose. And feeling our body grounded in whatever we may be sitting on. 
And bringing our awareness into the present, into our bodies. And simply being aware of whatever it is that's present. Maybe take one or two deep breaths. And allow the body to begin to settle along with the mind. And as we settle, let's see if we can find within us an altruistic motivation for our engagement and participation today. All of you presumably join because of your interest in learning a little bit more about meditation, the science of meditation. And why might we be interested in this? And let's see if we can find a place that goes all the way back to the recognition that calming our minds and opening our hearts through these practices is beneficial not only for ourselves, but for all the beings that we connect with, directly or indirectly. So let's take a few moments and see if we can find this altruistic motivation for our participation today. So for those of you whose eyes have been closed, please open them. And we can re-engage. And I'm going to share my screen now. OK, uh, is this visible? Can someone just let me know? Yes, this is fine. Okay. Great. Thank you, Yulia. OK, so. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to give an overview of some of the key insights from modern research on the science of meditation. When I give this talk in Madison to our local Turgar community, uh, the community is a large community, but uh, it's all the same people who come each time. So I made a commitment to the local community that when I give these talks, there'll always be new information in each one. Because today's talk is different, it's really for the global community, I have culled uh, from these various presentations and chosen a select uh, number of uh, findings and concepts to convey, uh, because many of you are here for the first time. So uh, for those of you from our local community, this may be a bit of a, re a review. Uh, uh, and hopefully for the others, uh, this will be uh, uh, some new information. And of course, we'll have questions and answers at the end. So please keep track of them. And I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. I want to just give a little bit of um, 
uh, of appreciation to those who have been especially influential in the development of this work. Uh, this is a picture of His Holiness the Dalai Lama when he visited our lab in 2001. Uh, this was uh, one of many, many visits he's made to Madison. He's actually been to Madison, Wisconsin, 16 times since he's been in exile. Uh, and uh, this was an occasion where we were showing him how the MRI can be used to interrogate the function and structure of the brain. And uh, this was the first time that His Holiness actually got to see functional MRI. Uh, this was in 2001 uh, when functional MRI was really first taking off. This was almost 20 years ago. I want to show a few other pictures just to uh, their inspiring pictures and um, uh, to uh, again uh, uh, express uh, uh, appreciation and devotion to uh, those who have played a very important role in nourishing this work. Um, this is Miguel Rinpoche when he was uh, around eight or nine years old, I don't exactly know how old, uh, he is sitting next to his grandfather, who is a great yogi. And uh, one of the inspiring um, insights for me about this photograph is simply appreciating uh, what a childhood that is surrounded by these extraordinary beings uh, might be like, uh, and how different it is from the upbringing that I think probably most of us who are participating in this um, webinar uh, 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 might have experienced. And one of the uh, considerations, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, it, to reflect upon is the plasticity of the developing brain and the importance of these early inputs uh, that great beings like Mingyur Rinpoche uh, have had the um, uh, uh, have had in their lifetime, and what impact that may have on shaping their mind and their brain. This is uh, a very old picture. It's probably hard to see, um, uh, and it's a picture of me and Dan Goldman, along with Dan, I'm holding Dan Goldman's child. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1974, and it was taken in Sri Lanka. This was the first visit that I made to Asia. Uh, I was in Sri Lanka and India, uh, where I got my first taste of meditation. Um, and uh, this was a trip that really helped to shape uh, my own commitment to this path um, and also uh, was the beginning of a lifelong friendship and partnership with Dan and uh, it's quite remarkable that he and I in 2017 published Altered Traits uh, on the Science of Meditation together. Uh, we've known each other for more than 45 years. Um, these are photographs that were taken from the very first uh, visit uh, to His Holiness the Dalai Lama that I made, this was in 1992. And on this visit, we were bringing instrumentation with us, uh, mobile instrumentation, which in those days in 1992, um, probably some of you weren't even born then, uh, but I can assure you that laptops were much larger in 1992 than they were today. Uh, also, we didn't have cell phones then, uh, and it was a very different world. Uh, and we were bringing equipment up into the mountains to caves and huts where yogis who are living in semi-retreat uh, around uh, up in the uh, mountains above Dharamsala are living. And we had the aspiration that we would collect such data this is an example of one of the um, yogis that we were uh, uh, in contact with. 
Uh, he is living in a hut, uh, a meditation hut above the uh, above Dharamsala. It's about an hour and a half trek to get there, and uh, this is just showing that we were videotaping some of the uh, sessions that we were doing. And um, this was a session that we had with His Holiness um, uh, showing him some of the equipment when we were there in 1992. And with us there, uh, right next to His Holiness, some of you may recognize that is Francisco Varela. Uh, Francisco was a very dear friend and, uh, of course, one of the co-founders of the Mind and Life Institute. And uh, Francisco was also a great neuroscientist and the founder of, uh, really, the founder of contemplative neuroscience. Uh, he inspired its creation. Uh, and then fast forward to uh, 2001. Uh, this is a picture of Mingyur Rinpoche in our lab. Uh, and uh, this was the first time we did recordings of uh, Rinpoche's brain activity during this time, and I'll tell you something about that soon. Now, this is a um, another inspirational photograph. This is a picture of a group of us that were invited by His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, to the Drepung Monastery. Uh, in the south of India, in Mungad, uh, which is a very large Tibetan resettlement region uh, where there are many large monasteries. And His Holiness asked us to present uh, a summary of the key scientific insights uh, that um, uh, were featured in Mind and Life Dialogues over uh, the last 10 years. And uh, this was to mark the occasion of the introduction of science into the monastic curriculum in the Gelug monasteries for the very first time. This was the largest change in the curriculum in these monasteries in probably 400 years. And His Holiness was um, uh, interested in having this meeting to showcase for um, the monastics, uh, the vital uh, nature of this science and the importance for this uh, of the dialogue between science and Buddhism. Uh, this is a photograph of the monastics who were attending that meeting. There are actually 10,000 monastics who attended that meeting uh, in Drepung. So um, this is a photograph taken in Drepung uh, in their science lab. They actually have now a science lab. Uh, and these uh, are uh, two monks who are debating. And they, their brain electrical activity is being recorded during the debate. Uh, and uh, scientists have actually been looking at the changes in patterns of brain activity during the debate, uh, which is a, uh, an important ingredient in the monastic training. Uh, uh, and uh, the monastics themselves are participating not just as research subjects, but as experimenters. And they are learning uh, how to operate the equipment, the significance of the signals they're recording, and so forth. And so uh, this is really quite an extraordinary outcome uh, of this journey to see that these monasteries actually have a science department now that is part of them. Okay, now I'm going to shift gears and move into uh, a few key themes that I'd like to mention before we jump into the actual findings. And the first theme that I'm going to talk about is neuroplasticity. Um, and I'd like to do the next poll. Uh, so uh, if we can have the next poll, please, um, before we go on. And the next poll is really about uh, your, um, 
experience uh, influencing the brain. Do you believe experience changes the brain? How many of you believe that? I love this. 99% uh, of you um, believe that experience changes the brain. There are two of you who do not. Uh, I'd love to hear from the two of you at some point. Um, but uh, uh, this is great. And uh, this uh, uh, is um, something that is so vitally important to uh, the scientific framework in which we consider the impact of meditation on the brain, uh, and that is recognizing that the brain does indeed change in response to experience and in response to training. Uh, I often say that the brain is constantly changing. Uh, most of the time, it's changing uh, as a consequence of forces around us about which we have little control. Uh, and we uh, are typically only dimly aware of these forces. And the invitation in this work is that we can actually take more responsibility for changing our brains for the better. We can cultivate healthy habits of mind. And through that, we can actually change our brains. And that is such a fundamental um, idea that underpins all of this work. The second theme uh, is uh, epigenetics, which is the equivalent of neuroplasticity in the realm of genomics. And epigenetics simply refers to the fact that our genes are constantly being regulated. So we're all born with a sequence of base pairs which constitute our DNA, and that, for the most part, will not change. But the extent to which a gene is turned on or turned off will change. And um, that's so important because we know, for example, that the way a mother behaves toward her offspring can induce epigenetic changes in the offspring. Mothers who are more loving and nurturant will affect the brain of their offspring in a positive way, and those changes can persist for a long duration of time. And we've recently demonstrated that among long-term meditators in a day of intensive practice, they can in one day induce a measurable epigenetic change and actually alter the expression of genes. So this is a powerful insight, and it suggests that our genetics are not merely as deterministic as we might have once thought. A third theme is that there's important connection between the brain and the body, uh, between the mind, brain, and the body, and it's bidirectional. So activities that are going on in our body influence our mind and brain, and activities that are occurring in our mind and brain influence our body. And it really is through these pathways of communication that we know that when we cultivate healthy habits of mind, it doesn't just produce a change in our subjective or psychological well-being. It actually influences our body in ways that are consequential for our physical health. And this is super important. And finally, the last theme uh, that I'll mention is the theme of innate basic goodness. Uh, this idea is probably the most controversial of these four themes, uh, and yet it has such important implications, and the evidence for it is growing uh, more and more strongly. This notion of innate basic goodness holds that all human beings come into the world with a predisposition, a preference for pro-social interactions. And by pro-social, we mean uh, interactions that are warm-hearted, uh, that involve sharing and cooperation. And uh, uh, 
what, when we think of kindness and when we think of compassion, we think of them in a way that is very similar to the way scientists think about language. We're all born with a capacity for language. But in order for that capacity to be expressed, we need to be, it needs to be nurtured. We need to be raised in a normal linguistic community. And by the way, I see a number of people who have their hands raised, and I'll be happy to take questions at the end. So we'll have plenty of time for questions. So hold your questions, and we will get to them at the end. So I want to illustrate um, how we study innate basic goodness. And this is a short video, really short. Uh, and this was a this is a video of puppets interacting. And this was shown to six month old babies. So I want to show you two videos. So here's the first one. And now the second one. Okay, which of those encounters do you think infants prefer, the first one or the second one? Now, I'm asking it rhetorically. We won't do a poll here. Uh, but um, the very uh, large majority of six-month-old babies prefer the first one where the puppet is helping the other to get what's inside the box. Uh, how do we know that? Well, there are many ways to know that. But one very simple way uh, with six-month-old babies is to have each puppet uh, that is held up to them and see which puppet it reaches for. And notice the puppets have different coloring. One has yellow, the other has red. And that was all switched up in the actual research, uh, counterbalanced, as we say. So sometimes the cooperative puppet wore yellow, other times the cooperative puppet wore red. It didn't matter. The infants reached not on the basis of color, but on the basis of their behavior. Uh, and they reach for the cooperative, uh, the pro-social puppet much more, uh, more than 90% of infants reach for the pro-social one. So these are the kind of data which lead us to uh, propose that there is this kind of innate basic goodness. So I want to, before we jump in, just um, very quickly uh, illustrate and underscore that there is an urgent need for training the mind in our culture today. There's an urgent need for us uh, on a large scale to cultivate well-being. Uh, many different countries in the world today are uh, having such significant problems that fundamentally are caused by a failure to thrive, uh, a failure to uh, flourish. Uh, and it is exhibited in all kinds of different ways. And I'll give examples from the U.S., but, um, and I know this is a large international group, um, but uh, uh, this is true for many of the uh, countries that our viewers are from. Some countries are doing better than others, but uh, there's huge amounts of suffering uh, in everywhere. So this is, I don't expect you to read this. I am just um, want to show this for illustrative purposes. This is a rank order of a simple measure of happiness in countries 
that comes from the World Happiness Report. This is the last from the last one issued. Uh, it is the 2019 World Happiness Report. Uh, those friends of ours who are from the Scandinavian countries, uh, you'll see that Finland and Denmark are the two, and Norway are the three top countries. Uh, the fourth is Iceland, the fifth is the Netherlands. So uh, those um, are the very top countries. And this is the ranking of uh, where countries fall on this very simple uh, measure of subjective happiness. Uh, and it's about 132 countries, I think, that are ranked. And for those of you who are from the US, I'll show you where the United States falls. Uh, it is 19th on this list. But more telling is the change over the last 10 years in the ranking. So this is the change in happiness from 2005 to 8 to 2016 to 18. So this is over a 10 year period. And when the bars go to the right, it indicates that there's an increase in happiness when the bars begin to go to the left, it means that there is a decrease in happiness. And I want to show you where the US falls in this list. So this is countries 1 to 52, 53 to 104. And this is the final group of 105 to 132. And the United States is 112 uh, out of uh, 132 countries in showing the, um, the the greatest decrease in happiness over the last 10 years. We're surrounded by Zambia and South Africa. Um, uh, and so uh, you can see uh, uh, that uh, there are many countries who have really not done very well over the um, last 10 years. You can also see Denmark here, for those friends from Denmark, is 106. So although Denmark did well over the last 10 years, they've actually uh, uh, gone significantly downward in their reports of happiness. Now, in the US today, depression is on the rise. Over the last six years, we see a very, very large increase. These are in diagnoses of major depression. And you can see it's much more prominent in women compared to men. There's been more than a 33% increase over the last um, six or seven years in major depression in the US. Uh, this is true among our youth also. Uh, rates of depression are skyrocketing in every age group uh, from 12 to 17 uh, over the last 10 years. And the gender difference is also getting stronger. Uh, we also see that suicide rate is unfortunately on the rise. Today, there's more than one teen suicide every day in the United States. So there is an urgent need for strategies that begin earlier in life to help uh, prevent some of the devastating consequences of a failure to flourish. So I want to um, mention here, this, this is a person who uh, was very influential and still is in uh, mental health research in the US. He was formerly the director of the National Institute of Mental Health uh, for 13 years. This is a US government agency that is the largest uh, funder of research in mental health in the world. And he was interviewed not too long ago, and he said um, this. He said he spent 13 years uh, at NIMH pushing on the neuroscience and genetics of mental disorders. And when I look back on that, I realized that while I think I succeeded at getting lots of really cool papers published by cool scientists at fairly large costs, I think $20 billion, I don't think we move the needle in reducing suicide, reducing hospitalizations, improving recovery for the tens of millions of people who have mental illness, I hold myself accountable for that. And Tom Insel now is a great believer in mindfulness and other um, meditation strategies to cultivate well-being.
Now, I want to move on in the last um, 20 minutes that we have to talk about a framework that we've developed in our center uh, for understanding well-being. And one of the primary architects of this framework is um, also uh, uh, the chair of, the, uh, of Turgar, uh, one of the founders of Turgar, uh, Cortland Dahl. Uh, who uh, is a long-term student of Mingyur Rinpoche. And uh, for those of you who have been in the Turgar community uh, for a while, you will see that there are elements of these four pillars of a healthy mind or well-being uh, that uh, exist within the Joy of Living program uh, in Turgar. Um, so, I want to go through these four pillars of well-being, and then we can talk about each in more detail. The first pillar is awareness. Uh, and this is where mindfulness would be. It includes the capacity to regulate attention. It also includes our capacity for what scientists call meta-awareness, which is knowing what our minds are doing. The second capacity, or the second pillar, is connection. And this is about the qualities that promote healthy social relationships, qualities like appreciation and kindness and gratitude. The fourth pillar, the third pillar, excuse me, is insight. Insight is about self-knowledge. It's insight into the nature of the self, the nature of the narrative that we all carry around about ourselves. At the very extreme, there are people who have a very negative narrative. They may have negative beliefs about themselves, and they hold those beliefs to be a true description of who they are. And of course, that is a prescription for depression. And finally, the last pillar of well being is purpose. Uh, purpose is about uh, connecting our values to our everyday activities. Um, really understanding our deepest motivation uh, for uh, why we may be engaged in the activities and path that we, 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 uh, we perform. Uh, and we know that having a strong sense of purpose in life is extremely important for our well-being and also for our physical health. In fact, among people who are in uh, their last few decades of life, having a strong purpose in life is the single most important psychological predictor of longevity. So let's talk a little bit more about each of these four components now. Uh, for awareness, I'm showing here a picture of William James, the great psychologist and philosopher William James wrote a two-volume tome in 1890, and in that book, he has a whole chapter on attention, and he said in that chapter, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. No one, it, no one is compo sui if he have it not. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence, but it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. And so uh, William James um, really, uh, I think, um, had uh, just this brilliant insight early on, and if he was more well connected with the contemplative traditions, he would have instantaneously seen that if nothing else, these were tra traditions that contain practices that enable us to regulate our attention. So this is a key finding from a study that was published 10 years ago where about 3,500 people uh, were queried on their smartphones with, of course, their permission, and they were asked three questions. The first question is, what are you doing right now? 
The second question is, where is your mind right now? Is it focused on what you're doing or is it focused elsewhere? And the third question is, right at this moment, how happy or unhappy are you right now? And what they found is that the average adult spends 47% of her or his waking life not paying attention to what they're doing. They are lost. Their monkey mind has taken over. And so this is um, uh, really kind of astounding. And we have the strong conviction that we could do better. Uh, we can actually bring this number down uh, and it's not uh, so complicated and we can all learn to better regulate our attention and recognize this great capacity with which we're all endowed the capacity for awareness. Okay, this is um, just another uh, copy of this picture of Mingyur Rinpoche. And one of the things we learned when we tested Mingyur Rinpoche on practices designed to um, recognize awareness and cultivate attention is that their brains changed in a remarkable way. Uh, this is data from the very first study we published with long-term practitioners like Mingyur Rinpoche, who is included in this group. Uh, on the left here is a resting state where they're not formally meditating. And then there is a meditation uh, period. And what you can see is that the brain electrical signal changes very clearly. You don't need fancy computer equipment to see that there is a difference. And what that difference consists of is high amplitude gamma oscillations. These gamma oscillations are markers of a substantial change in the brain that is associated with synaptic plasticity. It's also associated with states of heightened alertness and with periods of insight. Um, uh, and we could talk more about it in questions and answers, but this is a very important marker of um, uh, uh, of the skill in recognizing awareness. And uh, we found in this study that the number of lifetime hours of practice that we estimated through an extensive interview that we did with each of the long-term practitioners, that was associated with the magnitude of gamma oscillations that they exhibited. And I should say that in this study, the average length of lifetime practice was 34,000 hours. So you can do the arithmetic at home, but 34,000 hours is a very big number. Let's talk a little bit about connection. And here I want to illustrate this with um, research studies that were done with people who've never meditated before uh, to ask the question whether nurturing these qualities of connection can actually change the brain quickly. Uh, and we think it does because we're all endowed with innate basic goodness. And so when we engage in a practice to cultivate kindness or to cultivate compassion, we're not creating these um, states from nothing, but rather we're actually familiarizing ourselves with the basic nature of our own mind. And it is really because of this that we think these practices are pretty easy for people to learn and they begin to show changes in their brain very, very quickly. In one study that we did, we took a group of people who've never meditated before and we randomly assigned them to one group receiving uh, loving kindness and compassion practices. And they were just practicing over the course of two weeks for about 30 minutes a day two weeks, 30 minutes a day. So that's a total of seven hours of practice. And we compared them to a group of people that were trained on a strategy derived from cognitive therapy. They were taught to cognitively reappraise uh, certain kinds of negative events to have a more positive uh, outcome. 
And so that was basically the study, and we scanned people before and after they went through this training. We also gave them uh, uh, economic decision-making tasks, which enabled us to look directly at measures of altruism and pro-social behavior. So what we found is that the compassion group illustrated in green here, just after two weeks of training, is behaving in a more pro-social way. They're actually more altruistic compared to the group that received cognitive reappraisal training, and their brains were different. They actually showed a systematic difference in circuits in their brain, and in this case, what we're illustrating here is the connection between the prefrontal cortex and a region of the brain called the ventral striatum and specifically uh, a place within the ventral striatum called the nucleus accumbens, which is an area very important for certain kinds of um, positive emotion and positive motivation. So one other thing I want to mention here is this notion of implicit bias. In the United States today, there's a big achievement gap between blacks and white students in academic achievement. This achievement gap is driven by what educational researchers call a disciplinary gap. And that is the administration of harsh and punitive punishment to members of racial minorities. And um, uh, these uh, uh, differences in the administration of uh, these kinds of punishment or punitive measures or discipline is done largely unconsciously and is a result of implicit bias. And so we wanted to see whether training in awareness and in loving kindness and compassion among a group of teachers can actually reduce their bias. And so this is work that was done by Matt Hirschberg in our center. And I'll just show you the, this is very new data. I'll just show you the findings very briefly. Um, this is a measure of implicit bias. It's a behavioral measure, not a self-report measure, not a questionnaire. And um, when the, bars go down, it means that bias is reduced. Uh, and what we see is in the treatment group, those are the teachers who received the loving kindness and compassion training. Uh, they're actually showing a reduction in implicit bias compared to a group of controls who were randomly assigned to receive a standard curriculum uh, in their education classes that did not involve any um, mind training of this sort. We tested them six months later to look at the longer term impact of this kind of training. And we saw again that the teachers who received the loving kindness and compassion training uh, showed a continued reduction in implicit bias, whereas the controls showed no change. And so these findings suggest that we can perhaps get at the root of this, um, uh, the differences in how discipline is administered in the classroom um, by training in awareness and in loving kindness and compassion. And I want to um, mention that the word bias was never spoken in our training. So the training was not explicitly about bias at all. It was simply contemplative training in awareness and in loving kindness and compassion. I want to say a little now about insight. When we are able to practice uh, insight practices, which enable us to um, um, better understand at a very deep experiential level, the nature and the insubstantiality of the self, uh, where we can recognize this narrative that we have in ourselves for what it actually is, 
rather than getting hijacked by it, we see a really profound influence on uh, certain measures that we uh, link specifically to resilience. Um, and let me illustrate what I mean here. Imagine at this time point here, there's some stressful event that occurs, and I'm drawing a just a hypothetical curve that illustrates how aroused a person might be by this stressor. And we can compare it to a second person who experiences the same amplitude of response but notice that this person recovers much more quickly. The capacity to recover is literally the definition of resilience. People who can recover more quickly are more resilient. And this is something that results from insight. As we have more insight into the nature uh, and the um, uh, insubstantiality of the self, the fact that the self uh, is in fact changing, it's not permanent, it's not fixed. Uh, when we have that kind of insight, the, um, uh, the stressful experiences that we might encounter uh, don't completely take us over and we're able to recover more quickly. Uh, and one of the most um, uh, profound ways in which we can illustrate this is in response to the experience of physical pain. And so let me give you an example here uh, uh, of physical pain where we have non-meditators who are in uh, the light blue and long-term meditators who are in the gray. Uh, and this was a study where we that included Mingyur Rinpoche as one of the participants. And we administer pain with heat, um, which is very realistic but safe. And so the way this works is we give everyone the experience of this pain to begin with, and then we put them in the MRI scanner. And then we give them a tone that, illust that indicates that in 10 seconds, they're gonna get zapped with this pain. So they know the pain is gonna be coming on, uh, in 10 seconds, and that's what happens right here. So uh, for the non-meditator, they hear this tone, beep, and then uh, nothing happens for 10 seconds, and in 10 seconds, they know they're gonna get the pain. But if we track in the brain, the networks in the brain that are pain responsive, what we see in the non-meditators is that those networks begin to activate just in response to the tone. And then they continue to activate when the actual pain comes on right, whoops, uh, when the actual pain comes on right here. And so, and the, it takes them a long time to recover. Now let's see what happens with the long-term meditators. They hear the tone come on telling them that in 10 seconds, they're gonna get zapped with this pain nothing happens, absolutely nothing. Then when the pain comes on, they show a huge response. Actually, in certain areas of the brain, it's even stronger, the sensory areas. They're totally open. And then immediately when the pain goes off, they come right back down to baseline. This is the neural signature of resilience. And this is something that develops with insight. So I want to just very quickly run through purpose and show you that one specific finding to illustrate that having a strong sense of purpose in life uh, actually results in uh, or is associated with you living longer. So um, this is a slide where on the vertical axis we have uh, the um, likelihood of dying. And this is time and years. And these are people who are 70 years and older, tracking them over time and carefully matching them at the beginning on their medical histories. And the people who are in the 10th percentile on purpose in life, meaning that they're at the bottom of the distribution, they're showing the lowest 
sense of purpose in life, they are dying sooner. Among the people who are in the 90th percentile in having a strong sense of purpose, they are dying, uh, they're much less likely to die over that five-year period. So having a strong sense of purpose clearly gets under our skin, in our biology, and affects uh, our physical health. Now, this is an urgent public health need. We all need to uh, do our part to cultivate uh, a healthy mind. Uh, so one of the things we've been talking about is we can start with really short periods of practice. One of the things I remind people is that when human beings first evolved on this planet, none of us were brushing our teeth. And yet I'll bet that every person who is joining this webinar brushes their teeth. And I'll also bet that all of you consider your minds to be even more important than your teeth. And so can you envision a world where the vast majority of us, in addition to spending three or four minutes a day brushing our teeth, spent a little bit of time nourishing our mind. This world would really be a different place. So we can start really short. Even taking the small amount of time that we spend each day brushing our teeth. And we can do it as active practices. We can do it when we're walking, when we're actually brushing our teeth, when we're waking up in the morning, when we're walking, um, when we're commuting. So this is a slide to just summarize some of the distal consequences of cultivating well-being. By distal, we mean consequences that uh, are further down the line. They may take a while to uh, become apparent, but these are all documented changes in the scientific literature. So, um, whoops. We can reduce implicit bias. We can increase school achievement. We can actually reduce healthcare costs. We can improve teamwork and collaboration. We can reduce distraction and we can increase productivity, focus, creativity, and resilience. So clearly the trajectory that we've been on is not a particularly sustainable or healthy one. And it is our aspiration that the post-pandemic world will recognize the importance of well-being because the pandemic has um, uh, produced, in addition to the extraordinary suffering as a direct consequence of the virus, there also is a mental health challenge associated with it, both the impact of the quarantine, of physical distancing, uh, uh, and the ways in which our lives have changed. Uh, and so we can, I think, all envision a better and healthier post-pandemic world where uh, training the mind is incorporated as a systematic part. We have developed a, um, a simple program uh, to do this. Uh, it's uh, in the form now, one of its forms is a freely available app called the Healthy Minds Program. If you go to this website, tryhealthyminds.org, you can learn more about it. And join us, please become a citizen scientist. Uh, this is just some screenshots. And I want to end with a quote from Mingyur Rinpoche himself. He said, at any given moment, you can choose to follow the chain of thoughts, emotions, and sensations that reinforce a perception of yourself as vulnerable and limited, or to remember that your true nature is pure, unconditioned, and incapable of being harmed. You can remain in the sleep of ignorance or remember that you are and always have been awake. 
So thank you all so much. You can learn more about the work of our center on our website and social media. And uh, we can now uh, move to take questions. Thank you. All righty, we have about 10 questions. And the first question comes from Yi Kai. And during this prolonged isolation and stressful environment, in adolescence, what are some effective ways to cultivate and nurture the capacity for pro-social interactions? Well, thank you for the question. And um, uh, let me begin by saying that uh, I don't think one size will necessarily fit all. And I also believe that there are probably many different strategies that can be deployed to cultivate well-being. One of the most effective things that um, uh, uh, has been done with adolescents uh, that I know of is to get them involved in volunteer activities. Uh, and particularly during this time of the pandemic, there's so many needs out there uh, and so many opportunities for contributing to our local communities. Uh, and if we can uh, find those opportunities for adolescents to do it in a safe and healthy way, I think this can be enormously valuable. There are also programs to begin to uh, train uh, adolescents in certain types of mind training uh, through uh, apps through uh, uh, that are very widely available, including our Healthy Minds program, at least for older adolescents. Uh, uh, and there are many opportunities that are now being offered in different school systems through social and emotional learning. So um, I would encourage those adolescents that have those opportunities available to try them uh, because the scientific research indeed shows that they can be beneficial. Thank you. And Susie asks about with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, what are the effects of meditation? Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking it. The uh, most honest answer at this point is we don't yet know. Uh, but we also do know that both um, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, these are both uh, two neurodegenerative conditions. And when there is neurodegeneration, it induces inflammation in the brain. And we know that some of the symptoms of Parkinson's and of Alzheimer's are due not just to the primary problem in the brain, but also to the inflammatory response that's mounted. And so one of the really interesting possibilities is that meditation might be particularly helpful in reducing inflammation. We know that meditation, particularly compassion practices, are really helpful in reducing inflammation in the body. And there's good evidence for this. Uh, we don't yet know whether these practices will have the same impact on reducing inflammation in the brain. It's only been very, very recently, within the last five years, that there are now non-invasive measures that enable us to actually measure inflammation in the human brain for the very first time. Uh, we are now beginning to do that research as in our center uh, to investigate whether certain kinds of meditation practices have a direct effect on inflammation in the brain. And if they do, this would be a very important step in uh, uh, the pathway uh, to uh, understand how meditation might be beneficial for people with neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Excellent. Well, the questions have been coming in very quickly now. I think we're almost 50 questions now. So okay. we had a, a number of questions about the uh, body 
and the mind. And in particular, was referencing uh, years ago when you talked about the monks laughing uh, when you put the apparatus on the head instead of the heart. And so there's a question about any sense of where the mind is, the brain, the heart. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. And uh, uh, we can spend uh, hours on that question alone. Uh, modern neuroscience uh, uh, in the West has, I would say, uh, a very limited view of what constitutes the mind. Uh, if you look at classic textbooks of neuroscience, you will basically see them define the mind as what the brain does. Uh, really a very... Um, uh, in my view, superficial and reductionistic uh, kind of definition. Uh, what this um, viewer uh, was referring to is an incident that occurred many, many years ago in 1992 when we were showing a group of young monks at the Namgyal Monastery in Dharamsala how we put electrodes on the head, uh, and they started laughing when they saw the electrode cap on the head. And it turned out that they were laughing, not because the, uh, actually we were putting them on Francisco Varela, and not because Francisco looked funny with the electrode cap. They were laughing because we were talking about the study of compassion and we were putting electrodes on the head and not on the heart. Uh, and I know this viewer, I, I looked to see these questions earlier, and I know this viewer was asking about whether there have been any discoveries of changes in the heart uh, with these practices. And the answer is yes. Uh, and one of the cool things that we found in the long-term practitioners is that the synchrony uh, or the communication between certain regions of the brain and the heart is um, uh, dramatically enhanced during compassion meditation. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, a potentially really interesting clue as to what is occurring during compassion practice, and it may be strengthening the connections that, do, that we know exist between the brain and the body. Excellent. Then we have a question that comes in about autism spectrum disorder and have people examined the effects of meditation with ASD? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, there's very limited uh, evidence at this point in time for uh, the impact of meditation on autism spectrum disorder. Uh, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware that um, the autism spectrum is indeed a spectrum. It's a broad spectrum, and um, uh, there's a tremendous variation within that spectrum. Uh, also, uh, basic research on autism clearly indicates that there are multiple factors that contribute to autism. It's not uh, a simple kind of disorder. My own view is that for some, um, for some people on the autism spectrum, uh, certain kinds of practices uh, may uh, be helpful. And in fact, um, Scott Anderson himself, who is asking the questions, is uh, um, uh, a uh, graduate student in kinesiology and doing research uh, and has done research related to this and actually has looked at the impact of certain kinds of breathing um, practices and other related practices on um, uh, individuals with autism and found some beneficial uh, results in some pilot work. And so there is there are some uh, 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 studies that are occurring in this general area, but at this point in time, it's still very much uh, early stages in this research. Great, thank you. Mateo writes, he's 11 years old from Mexico and having read your book, Altered Traits, when training the mind, uh, the periods can be short, short times, many times, 
And the question is, is it necessary to do formal practice for a long time to have the positive changes in the brain? Yeah, that's a great question, Matteo, and um, thank you for uh, your interest, and uh, uh, it's inspiring to see uh, a boy 11 years old who, who has such a, an abiding interest in these areas. Um, the honest answer to your question is we don't know. Uh, we really don't know uh, how much formal practice is necessary to produce certain kinds of changes. Uh, this is still very much early stages in scientific research. What we do know is that people who have devoted a lot of formal practice um, do have brains that are really different. Uh, just to give you one little tidbit, uh, we were able to do a case study of Mingyur Rinpoche himself, and we were able to look at the rate at which his brain is aging, because we had a, a series of MRI scans that we did over the course of 12 years. And so we, we were able to examine the question, how quickly was his brain aging over the course of this 12 years? And we compared it to a group of controls who've never meditated over this same period of time. And what we found is that Mingyur, Mingyur Rinpoche's brain is aging much more slowly. Uh, and so these are really profound changes uh, that we did not initially expect to see. Uh, whether these changes depend on years of formal practice or not, we simply don't know at this point in time. Whether it's possible to achieve similar effects through active practices, we don't know. Uh, when we were testing some of the meditators uh, who are living in semi-retreat uh, around Dharamsala, one of them told us once that um, uh, he was very modest and he said, I really don't have much ability, uh, which is really, he said, why I meditate so much because I really need it. There are some people who are just like this without meditating. They don't need to meditate so much. So we really don't know. Um, uh, uh, and these are many of the questions that will uh, be rich opportunities for future research. Great. We've had a few questions about different forms of meditation. And this particular question from Anne, uh, if she teaches and reads about the intersection of Christian meditation and brain science and was interested in what research has been done in that domain. Yes, thank you for asking that question. Uh, it would be wonderful to see a vibrant contemplative neuroscience flourish with many different religious and spiritual traditions. Uh, and it's beginning to uh, emerge for some traditions. And so there's been a little bit of work that I'm aware of on the impact of uh, certain kinds of centering prayer, for example, in the, Christian, in the Christian tradition on the brain and behavior. This work, though, is still in a very, very early stage, and uh, there aren't that many scientists who are engaged in this work, although there are a few. Uh, and so uh, it's certainly our aspiration to see this uh, occur across different uh, religious traditions, but this will take some time to develop. Great. So the next question is about formal and informal practices. And this person reports having a hard time sitting still and wondering if in the brain, mind, body, if there are differences between formal practice and informal practice. Yeah, thank you for asking that. It's really an important question. Uh, one of the things that we have uh, done in our Healthy Minds app that is freely available is you can engage in practices either as formal sitting practices or as active practices. An active practice may be practicing while you're walking, practicing while you're commuting, practicing while you're doing physical exercise, practicing when you're doing your laundry. Uh, it is possible to 
engage in practice as we are going about activities of daily living. But we do not know at this point in time the extent to which the practices that you do actively are similar or different in their effects from practices that you do more formally. They've never been systematically compared. One of the reasons why we have released our app in this way is to enable us to actually study this. Uh, but I would say that if you have trouble doing sitting practice and you can engage in practice when you are walking or when you are um, uh, commuting, doing physical exercise, then please keep doing it. Um, I often say that the very best kind of meditation that you can possibly be doing is the form of meditation that you actually do, whatever it might be. Uh, so I think that continuity and regularity of practice is really important. So if you're able to do this when you're engaging in these other activities, keep trying it. And uh, if you find that after some period of time, you can then sit more formally and you find that helpful, then um, you can uh, begin to uh, investigate that for yourself. Uh, but um, uh, I would say pay attention to uh, how you're doing, to what's going on in your own inner experience, and use that as a guide. Great. And Trish asked the question that uh, Madison, for example, is a relatively wealthy community open to things like meditation and asking the question, how to present meditation to the masses and break down perceptual barriers? Yeah, so um, this is something that is uh, obviously extremely important and it is um, an area that we're deeply committed to, and uh, uh, certainly we don't have uh, all the answers. In fact, I would say we don't even have all the questions at this point. Uh, we are, however, collaborating with a number of groups uh, where we are attempting to reach um, uh, very uh, disadvantaged uh, and, in certain cases, highly traumatized populations. Just to give you one example, uh, we've just completed the data collection of a study uh, in um, Colombia uh, with a group of teenage girls, uh, all of whom have been subjected to very significant trauma, uh, to um, physical abuse, sexual abuse. Uh, and these were girls who uh, were able to participate in a one-week intensive camp experience this past summer, uh, where they uh, were in a residential camp that was freely offered for um, uh, teenagers who have had these horrendous experiences uh, uh, in this um, uh, in in, in Colombia, and uh, uh, we're just finishing the analysis of one set of data looking at symptoms of anxiety and depression and um, post-traumatic symptoms. And I can tell you that there is a dramatic change that we see over the course of just one week of this intensive intervention. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this intervention is not just meditation. It also includes a number of other components uh, because we wanted to build in uh, a, a number of elements that we thought would be most helpful. With our friends and colleagues in Mexico, uh, with a group called Atentamente, uh, we are working in uh, parts of Mexico that are extremely poor, uh, where we are training educators, teachers, and school principals, and looking then at the downstream impact of that training on kids, many of these kids who are a vast majority of them in certain states who are living in extreme poverty. And again, the early findings from this work uh, clearly suggest that these strategies can be very beneficial. So there's still a long way to go, but there are some signs that um, many of these methods can be 
deployed in the right way with communities of color, with communities that are um, in poverty, uh, and that they can be enormously helpful in enabling these groups to better cope with the challenges they experience. Great. And there have been a number of questions about the different forms of meditation, and specifically people are asking about mindfulness and loving kindness and compassion practices. And would you recommend one or the other for particular conditions such as anxiety or depression? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And uh, unfortunately, the majority of questions that you're asking, the most appropriate answer is we don't know. Um, uh, so uh, what we do know is that uh, quite remarkably, uh, when you engage in a loving kindness and compassion practice, uh, at least in the populations in which this has been tested, you tend to see changes on objective measures of the brain and behavior more quickly than you do with simple mindfulness practices. Um, uh, and uh, that is a conclusion that we came to when Dan Goldman and I wrote our book, Altered Traits, and surveying um, literally thousands of studies that have been done in the scientific literature. Um, and it may well be that because we all come into the world with innate basic goodness, when we do a loving kindness or compassion practice, we're connecting to this innate basic goodness. And it actually is pretty, it, 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 for most people, it comes pretty readily. Uh, and so uh, uh, I would say that um, it's worth exploring which might be better in a particular situation. In terms of which might be better for anxiety or depression, um, there are different kinds of anxiety and depression, and uh, we just don't have enough evidence at the present point in time to really be prescriptive about this. Although this is, again, one of the things that we hope to achieve with our app so that we can get it out to enough users and it will enable us to collect enough data so that we can actually begin to match uh, a person's baseline characteristics with the practices that may be most effective in helping them to nurture their well-being. Excellent. We have well over 60 questions now. Do we have time for one more? Uh, I'm fine answering one more, absolutely. Excellent. Phil asks, is daydreaming nourishing? Very good and difficult question. Um, uh, a lot of time we daydream when we're supposed to be doing something else, so to speak. Uh, it may be, you know, we're sitting uh, at our desk trying to do some work, and then we have a daydream, and our, often our minds are lost, and we, um, uh, we might not even realize that we're daydreaming uh, for several minutes, and then we sort of come to, we wake up, and we realize that we've been daydreaming. And sometimes we remember the daydream, other times we may not. So uh, I would say that a lot has to do with our awareness. Uh, and if we're daydreaming with full awareness, and for example, we are um, engaged in a daydream that might be a creative uh, kind of problem solving daydream, uh, that might be very valuable. Uh, but if we're daydreaming without awareness, uh, where we're just getting lost, uh, it probably is not so helpful. And it's kind of like dreams. Every one of us dreams every night. But a lot of the time, for many people, they don't remember their dream. Uh, and if we can cultivate our awareness so that we are fully present when we do daydream and fully present when we dream, we can actually harness this creative mental activity, which is happening all the time. So one of the things that I'll frequently recommend to students of mine is that uh, they actually reserve some time each week 
to intentionally daydream, where they actually let their mind roam, but with full awareness, uh, so that they can capture uh, and be fully present for whatever may be coming up. Uh, and in that way, they can better harness the creative activity that is the stuff of a daydream. And let me just say that I really apologize for not being able to answer more questions. I know this can go on for uh, much longer, and I know that uh, for some of you it's later in the day, uh, but uh, I want to thank you all for this great opportunity. Thank you, Richie. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So much, um, Dr. Davidson, for this inspiring and comprehensive presentation about the newest insight into the meditation, into the science of meditation. And thank you, Scott, for helping with the question and answering, and our translators who are working in the background, and also several other people working in the background to make this happen. And if you are interested, in knowing more about meditation other than the app from the Center of Healthy Minds and the resources they have. Also, I encourage you to check out um, the online um, opportunities we have at Turgar. Um, there is an upcoming, I will show some slides at the end. There are upcoming um, Joy of Meditation, uh, Joy of Living Meditation courses. Uh, online and also check out your local Tergar uh, groups um, in your different countries and your different um, cities and see what they have to offer. So, and, if I, and if I can just uh, say that the Joy of Living program devised by Mingyur Rinpoche is really um, uh, an extraordinary opportunity. And for those of you who are relative newcomers, but even for experienced meditators, uh, I always say that this is, in my view, um, the most comprehensive uh, program available. I would strongly encourage anyone who's interested to check it out. Uh, also, for beginning meditators, uh, my um, go-to book to introduce a person to meditation is Mingyur Rinpoche's Joy of Living, which I still very much um, believe is the best introduction available, uh, and so would strongly encourage all of you to uh, explore that if you haven't already. And also we have an upcoming talk with Dr. Davidson and Mingyur Rinpoche on um, November 22nd, and uh, the registration for that will come out soon. And we also will send you some information tomorrow about upcoming classes and Joy of Living Meditation groups that you could join if you'd like. And thank you so much, Yulia, and thank you to all of the staff from uh, Turgar International who uh, helped uh, make this possible. And thank you to my dear friend and colleague, Scott Anderson, uh, for helping to shepherd the questions. Thank you.